Nice to see a good audience today. Thank you for coming for this program. We at KSA used to have these uh, series of health uh, talks earlier, but during COVID, unfortunately, we could not carry on. We tried a couple of uh, uh, webinars, but I'm happy to see so many people here today to attend this uh, lecture. The first lecture after a gap of almost three years, a physical lecture. Uh, we are happy to invite and uh, welcome Dr. Arjun Anand Gokani today. He is an ophthalmologist. And uh, I leave the main introduction to him himself because he has got a list of uh, achievements which I might forget. So he will cover them. But as far as I am concerned, he passed from uh, uh, KM Hospital, his MBBS. Before that he was in cathedral school and uh, then from KM he passed his MBS, then he went to Kolkata for his uh, post graduation MS and then he has worked at the prestigious uh, Shankaraya Mitsale in uh, Chen Chennai, right? Yeah. And uh, right now he is attached to various places, he works at KM, he is a professor at uh, KM, he is in charge of glaucoma, he has specialized in glaucoma surgery but he does other uh, of the work also. So I would like to welcome him with uh, a small uh, bouquet from uh, the KSA on behalf of all of you. Mr. Mahesh Kalyanpur, Chairman. Welcome. And uh, without wasting much time, I'll uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Arjun Bukani for his talk. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, sir, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, first and foremost, thank you for this opportunity and for coming on a Sunday morning. We all know how precious Sunday mornings are. And also for the opportunity for me to come to the health center and check and uh, be the on-call ophthalmologist for you all. It's a great honor to be that. And uh, special thanks to Prakash, sir, who literally is like a father figure in my profession. He, his wisdom and his advice has seen me through a lot of sticky situations in my career also. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, let me start. I'll, I'll give a brief introduction about myself first. So as I said, I, I went to school in cathedral school. And from 7th standard, it was always, always my dream to become a doctor. From 7th or 8th standard, one of the two years. So when I reached my 12th standard, I realized that I did now have to work really hard to get a good seat. So I had to study for the entrance exam. While all my friends were studying to go abroad, I was studying to do the entrance exam. And it did. I had to take a gap year because we had a different board exam and things like that. So after taking a gap year, I was lucky enough to secure a good rank. I came 10th in the state of Maharashtra and then I got into KEM hospital, which we all know is one of the best uh, medical colleges in Maharashtra and in India also. So I started my journey at KEM and through my five and a half years I learned everything there is to learn about the entire body. And yes, there are a lot of fields, there are a lot of uh, branches of medicine that are more life saving than ophthalmology like cardiology or neurology or neurosurgery, a lot of things that save people's lives. But what I realized in my MBBS is that if you save someone's eyes, you're not only improving their life, but they are improving their quality of life, which is sometimes more important than life itself. What is the point of living if you don't have a good quality of life? So I realized that this would be something that I would be very interested in and improving people's quality of life is what I'm, you know, it used to make me feel very passionately about it. So I decided I'll do ophthalmology. And again went through the whole entrance exam rut and luckily this time I got it in the first shot. I went to Calcutta to do my ophthalmology which was a very comprehensive uh, all-inclusive ophthalmic uh, three-year course. And I learned everything there is to learn about the eye but I still required some more polish. So for that after Calcutta Medical College I went to the prestigious Shankar Netralaya in Chennai which is considered to be the temple of the eye across the whole world. And I spent 18 months there. I learned everything there is to learn about glaucoma and also cataract surgeries. And it refined me as an ophthalmologist. After that, I came back 
to Bombay uh, for around six years ago and I was working in KEM hospital again. I thought I'll give back to the same institute that gave me so much. So I was working with a lot of poor people and I had a lot of experience with all kinds of different cases. And around three years ago, I fought, uh, ventured into my own private practice and uh, I've had my clinic for the last three years and I've also been attached to KSA for the last six months. So that's, that's my story so far. Now let me give you a few uh, tips and uh, let me educate you a little bit about the eyes and how you can take care of your eyes so that you know you don't uh, uh, suffer from any eye related problems later on. So let's start with how the eye works first. I'll one second. Yeah. So, as you can see, this is a diagram. This is the eye as we see it in the mirror every time we look at look at ourselves. But how the eye actually looks is something more like what we are seeing on our left hand side. So the eye is a round balloon like structure, which, uh, as you can see, there is a small window in the eye. This is called the pupil. Through this, the eye, in, the light enters into the eye and it hits the retina. So much like a camera, you all are all familiar with how a camera used to work. Now the cameras are all on our phones. But earlier, when we had uh, films that we had to develop in the studio, this is how the camera used to work. A light would enter the eye through the lenses, through an aperture, and then it would hit the film, and the photo would develop on this film. Similarly, the eye is like an old-fashioned camera. Uh, the light enters the eye through these, this aperture, through the lens. The lens is uh, the uh, focusing uh, structure. The, uh, the same lens in the camera, we have a similar lens in the eye also. After the lens changes the direction of the light, it falls on the retina and an image is formed on the retina. So the retina is like the film that we use in our cameras. And then this image is sent to the brain. So this is basically how the eye works. Now I will be discussing a few common eye problems. Uh, we will start with cataract, I will go to glaucoma, dry eyes, diabetic retinopathy and age related macular degeneration also. So briefly touching upon each of these topics. So what is a cataract? So as I mentioned earlier in the earlier uh, slide, the eye has a focusing uh, structure called the lens inside it. Now that lens has to be clear like glass. What happens in cataract is that glassy like lens it becomes opaque so it doesn't allow light to go through it now as you can see in these pictures this is a, a lens where the cataract is developing it's in its early stage only the central part is uh, opaque whereas this lens on the right side is mature the entire lens has become opaque so probably no light is entering inside this eye and the patient is practically blind in that eye so what do you what should you notice that when you start developing a cataract, what you should look out for. Every time you are driving at night or if you are sitting in a car and the oncoming headlights, if you see a bright glare like thing, then you should suspect that you have started developing a cataract. Or if you look at a light and there are spokes like a bicycle wheel, then you should start suspecting that a early cataract is forming. Or if you start seeing a halo around light like in this image. If you start seeing a halo around light, that's another sign that you have you have an early form of cataract. So this is what ca light uh, cataract does to the light. So in a normal eye, the light enters the eye and it's focused sharply on the retina. Whereas in a cataractous eye, the light enters the eye, the lens which is opaque, it throws the light in all different directions. That's why we see everything with a glare or with halos or like a bicycle wheel with the spokes around it. So it doesn't help us to focus on any object. Now the treatment for this is fairly simple although there is no medical treatment it's only a surgical treatment we have to remove that lens though now with technology everything is done through the laser technique. So what the laser technique is is basically we take a small probe which goes inside the eye through a 2 millimeter incision unlike the earlier days where we used to make a big incision and we used to suture that incision and you would have to stay at home for a month or two now everything is done through a keyhole literally a 2 millimeter incision the laser probe goes inside it zaps the cataract it liquefies it and then it just sucks it out and then through the same 2 millimeter incision we inject a foldable lens which goes inside and opens like a flower 
and it sits there forever so the healing and uh, the recovery time is as good as around a week or 10 days and even after 2 3 days you can start working and moving out of the house so now moving to glaucoma so i'll take questions at the end of my talk if you all have any questions um, now moving to glaucoma so as i mentioned earlier the eye is like a big water balloon it's like a inflated water balloon and as we know water balloons also have pressure inside it the more water we fill inside a water balloon the more pressurized it gets so the similarly the eye also is filled up with a water now if the water becomes if excess water is created or uh, the drainage of water out of the eye is uh, hampered if there is no drainage out of the eye the water accumulates inside the eye and it causes the eye to get pressurized so eye pressure is very different from blood pressure a lot of times patients say is it the same as blood pressure it's completely different eye pressure is basically the water pressure inside the eye due to the accumulation of water inside the eye now if the pressure goes very high it starts pressing on this optic nerve over here and slowly slowly over a span of months or years that optic nerve starts getting permanently damaged and unfortunately glaucoma the early stages of glaucoma are not noticeable to you all unless you all come to a eye doctor and get the pressure checked yourself you all will not know whether you have glaucoma or not the only time when a person with glaucoma knows they have glaucoma is when it's too late and what happens when it's too late your vision starts constricting and you start getting tunnel vision means your peripheral field of vision is what gets affected first so unless someone is in a occupation or is some uh, someone who is very observant the you won't be able to tell unless your vision is become tunnel vision that you have glaucoma that's why glaucoma is something that you have to after the age of 40 you have to get yourself screened for glaucoma every 6 months because you never know when you develop it and how soon the optic nerve damage starts so this is something that happens in end stage where you start getting tunnel vision because your peripheral field of vision has started constricting now the treatment of glaucoma on the flip side is very simple it can be treated by simply using some drops or a small laser procedure depending on the type of glaucoma the reason of your glaucoma so there are certain glaucomas where a laser is helpful but in most other cases just simply applying drops is very helpful and it can uh, it can solve the problem for your for the rest of your life means you won't have any optic nerve damage for the rest of your life if you just simply use the drops so having glaucoma is not the end of the world but getting screened for it is very important now moving on to dry eyes so dry eyes is something that we are all suffering from nowadays because of all the pollution and also the smog in the air quality is very bad and also there is construction going on so everyone suffering from irritable dry itchy eyes so now before i move to uh, what is dry eyes i just wanted to show you a diagram which explains what the tear film the film of uh, fluid that covers the eyes what it looks like when we magnify it with a microscope so if when we magnify it it has these three layers if you can see this green layer it's a mucus layer it's stuck on, it's a, it's like a glue that sticks the tears onto the surface of the eye the blue layer is all water so that's why when we and it's almost 80% of our tears is water that's why when we feel our tears they feel watery and this yellow layer is a film of oil in front of the tears in front of the water that prevents it from evaporating so all three are very important for us to have comfortable eyes for the tears to do its job properly if any of these three things is deficient we'll all suffer from dry eyes so now what happens uh, in the majority of people with dry eyes is the oil secreting gland as i said the oil over here is of key importance because it prevents the water from evaporating off our eyes now the oil secreting glands are in our eyelids if you ever notice closely in the mirror the eyelids have these openings which secrete this oil and when they get blocked they become big and they start pouting they get swollen and they become yellow it's like how we have these a cooking oil bottles or a hair oil bottles in winter when they become hard you know when the oil becomes hard inside it's like that so when you when you press on these oil glands it comes out like a toothpaste literally so when these get blocked that oil secreting the oil layer in front of the tears is not there and the tears are evaporating 
So the simple treatment for this is just doing warm water compress. So how we put the hair oil bottle in a bucket of warm water or a bowl of warm water to liquefy it. Like that if we just do warm compress where you take a bowl of warm water, you dip a cloth in it and you just massage your eyes. It frees up all the oil in the glands and it starts flowing again. And also you have to scrub your eyelashes with either a baby shampoo or a face wash to dislodge any dust or any pollution that has accumulated at the openings of these glands. Sometimes dust blocks the gland from allowing oil to come out. So if you just scrub your eyelids, it opens up and the oil starts flowing again. Now moving to diabetic retinopathy. Now diabetes is a, is, is a, it's almost like a pandemic, but in India it's also becoming one of the, you know, leading cause of lifestyle diseases. And um, along with diabetes, it affects all the other organs, including the eyes. Now how it affects the eyes, before I tell you about that, this is a retina. On the right, on your left side is a normal looking retina. Now you just compare the retina to a garden with a nice irrigation system. So the blood vessels are like the irrigation system of the gardens, like the sprinkler system. If the irrigation system and the sprinklers are working perfectly well, the grass will grow very nicely. So here you can see on the left side, the orange retina is like a green garden where all the grass is growing, it's very lush and the irrigation system is working perfectly well. Now what happens in diabetes? Diabetes goes and blocks all the small blood vessels of your retina. So it's like having an irrigation system where half the pipes are blocked and half the, uh, uh, st the sprinklers are leaking. So what happens in that situation? The grass will not grow, it won't be green. There will be a lot of puddles of water everywhere and the garden will just simply not look very nice. Similarly, in the eyes also you will have these small accumulation of blood, hemorrhages everywhere. You will have areas where the retina tissue has died off because it's not received any blood or any oxygen. So it eventually it causes a lot of uh, pooling of blood everywhere as you can see in this image below which is a magnified picture of the retina there is a big accumulation of blood here whereas on the left the retina is perfectly flat and this hampers the vision in a way where you know if you uh, if you look at an object you will start seeing black spots in the field of vision it won't be a very well defined thing but you will see black images everything will look a little funny it will look distorted, a straight line will look curvy to you. In fact, if you look at the left side image, that's a clear image of a boy playing with his uh, baseball. But on the right side, everything is looking like you're looking through an oil stained glass. So that's how it looks with diabetic retinopathy. Now the simple way to prevent that is of course to manage your blood sugar, regular exercise, following a good diet and taking your medicines on time is what usually prevents 90% of diabetic retinopathy. Unfortunately, if someone already has diabetic retinopathy, then they need to consult an ophthalmologist, then the treatment, uh, then the treatment comes into play. Now the treatment of it is also fairly simple. Again, obviously the sugar has to be controlled, but if there is a lot of edema, a simple injection can take care of that. But that injection is given inside the eye. And if there is extensive edema and there is extensive diabetic retinopathy, then we have to laser off the parts of the retina that have been damaged by the retinopathy so that the other parts of the retina get the blood and the oxygen and they survive. So either it's a, a injection or it's a laser to treat it. Now coming to the final topic which is age related macular degeneration. Now age related macular degeneration is something that happens to people after the age of 60 usually and especially if and it can happen little earlier if you have a high cholesterol so what happens is there is a layer in the retina the retina is made up of 11 layers it's like a multi-layer cake if you cut it across its uh, uh, cross section one of the layers if cholesterol and oil starts accumulating at that layer like you can see this red layer has a lot of these uh, accumulations of oil and cholesterol which you can see as these yellow dots over here that is an early form of age related macular degeneration. Now this is known as dry age related macular de degeneration but eventually what happens is this layer breaks and blood vessels start growing through it. Now these blood vessels that grow they are like newborn babies. They have no control. So the blood is leaking from these blood vessels. It's not, it's not contained just inside the vessel. It is leaking from these blood vessels 
and then it becomes a wet armd now wet armd is very dangerous we do not want the dry to become a wet what happens in wet is you get large hemorrhages or those hemorrhages can absorb and it can cause a big scar to form in the middle of your eye and this leads to permanent blindness now how to prevent armd and how to prevent dry armd from becoming wet armd firstly again it's all lifestyle you have to have a lot of green leafy vegetables you have to avoid smoking at any cost you have to have all your vitamin levels perfect so it's always advisable after the age of 50 to take some form of multivitamin if the dry armd becomes wet and it's in the early stages then we can still treat it by giving monthly injections inside the eye but unfortunately if a wet armd becomes very advanced and it's already caused scar tissue there's nothing that we can do therefore again after the age of 50 that's the importance of getting your eyes checked regularly and if you start seeing some distortion in your vision come immediately to get your vision checked so some take home points now i don't know if anyone is familiar with this painting has anyone ever seen this painting before it's by a very famous uh, european artist it's called the starry night by van gogh so the reason why i ha- i even have this painting hanging in my clinic the reason why it, this painting is so um, it's so uh, symbolic for me is because the artist himself was suffering from cataract when he painted this because if you notice these stars they have these large halos around it now back in the day back in those days in the 1800s and the 1700s no one had there was no laser technique of treating cataract if you got a cataract you would just live with it so he is someone who had to live with his cataract but next time you go out into the night sky we look at the stars and if it looks something like this then do come to the health center for a check up and um, secondly if you complain of if you have a lot of aches in your brow or in your eyes that could mean that your eye pressure is slightly high so keep that in mind also keep keep uh, be wary of what your field of vision is keep constantly test yourself check yourself whether you can see things in the periphery of your vision especially when you are driving and things like that make sure that you notice things that are happening on the side because if you can't then it's time to get yourself checked for glaucoma yeah that's my talk for today i'd like to take some questions also. thank you so it happens bilaterally uh, so the question is is ar armd a unilateral or a bilateral uh, disease so it happens in both eyes it might happen more in one eye and less in the other eye it's not very symmetrical but it happens usually in both eyes and pego emulsion cataract yes sir is it different than laser because there is confusion so in No so basically laser so the question is is laser technique and phaco emulsification the same yes it is the same sometimes non medical people like to use the word laser actually it's not a laser it's a very good question it's actually a very ultrasonic sound energy that we send into the into the lens which liquefies the lens it makes it into a liquid or a powder and then that powder is sucked through the tube of the of the probe so it in the science uh, aspect it's not a laser it's ultrasonic sound is there any drainage system inside it gets blocked and all or in the phaco machine not in phaco in general yeah in the eyes you mean yeah so 360 degrees in the eye there is a drainage it's almost like a gutter of the eye where all the fluid goes and it drains and it goes into the blood now many times sometimes due to anatomical uh, issues or sometimes due to genetics those drainage channels are blocked or they are very narrow even if they are very narrow it doesn't allow the outflow of fluid to happen as rapidly as it should now in those cases the pressure inside the eye can go high but fortunately with a simple laser procedure you can open that entire drainage system and the flow can uh, go back to normal and the pressure falls down again pressure should be between 10 and 20 uh, millimeters of mercury so if it exceeds then i have to if it exceeds that then with some drops we have to bring it back down below 20 and operation is also there 
if we have used more than four medicines and still the pressure is high or if the patient's pressure is extremely high where we know medicine is not going to work then there are a lot of operations that we can do we can put a valve inside the eye or we can make a connection from inside the eye to outside so that there is uh, pressure equalization so there are procedures lot of procedures that we can do depending on the cause of the uh, spike in pressure yes sir so the question is how do we prevent eye damage in uh, when we use uh, the computer and the laptop a lot good very good question for this day and age at least so we cannot avoid using the computer a lot of us have jobs where we have to use the laptop for 12 hours positioning of the laptop is very important it has to be in such a way that your eyes are constantly looking downwards so the top of the laptop should be in line with your neck basically when you all are sitting on the laptop so that your eyes and your neck and your shoulders are not strained secondly every 20 minutes it's always advisable to take a break for 20 seconds only sometimes i tell my patients to set an alarm on their watch which keeps ringing every 20 minutes because they forget if you're deep in a article or something you're reading something you, hours can go by and you will not take a break so every 20 minutes just look far away for 20 seconds blink your eyes and just relax them because what happens is when we are focusing on the laptop we are focusing on minute pixels so the eyes are constantly struggling to focus on these small small pixels and towards the end of the day the eyes become very tired and you don't feel comfortable so every 20 minutes if you take a break for 20 seconds it's uh, it helps relax your eyes same goes mobile phone is even worse actually because laptop is at least at a distance mobile phone is close to your face so mobile phones as much as possible you should avoid only if it's really important or something i i would recommend not playing any games on the mobile phone because that also is unnecessary time waste and it's a unnecessary usage of mobile so sometimes and children use it a lot and because of that we're seeing a big rise in spectacle numbers in children you know Yeah, it should be in line with your neck, sir. The top of the laptop should be in line with your neck, so that you know your your gaze is thirty degrees down. It should be thirty degrees down. Yeah. Do you suggest any eye exercises? Sir, eye exercises is not really. I mean, generally in the morning when you wake up, it's always good to splash your eyes with cold water. Move your eyes in all three sixty direct in the in all three all directions, three sixty degrees. blink your eyes a few times so that you know your tears also start secreting but other than that just keep good health general body health is good enough to keep your eyes healthy if you close your eyes and look at a light source mm mm-hmm. you see lines in your eyes what are they so those lines are either your blood vessels or their floaters so with age what happens is the jelly inside the eye it starts degenerating which is normal it doesn't cause any vision problems But you'll see it as small threads floating around in your eyes, and when you close close your eyes and you look at a bright light source, what you're seeing is the same vessels of your retina. You're seeing that. So those lines are basically your blood vessels on the retina. They are not harmful. They are not harmful. Sir. It helps in age-related macular degeneration. That's why a very good healthy diet is important. A diet which is rich in nuts and things like that, which has this omega-3 fatty acids, that is very good to prevent age-related macular degenerations. Any eye drops for this? No, sir. Not for age-related because the drops don't penetrate and go all the way to the retina. Or for uh, natural neuropathy. Sorry. diabetic retinopathy ah, so just controlling your diabetes is good enough there are no drops that reach the retina so actually the eye is swollen the eye is swollen because of what sir what do you what do you want to report edema computer diabetic edema or but you don't usually so any edema around the eye if it's because of a systemic problem because of the body 
nothing no drops is going to help you have to take care of what is wrong inside the body first then the edema will go and if there is any diabetic retinopathy then either a, a, a drop is not going to help because it won't reach the retina and if you had retinopathy if you have retinopathy then it's already at a stage where drops are not going to help but there are no drops that help in the retina anyway just simply controlling your blood sugar is um, is more than enough how does the retina get displaced means detached yeah. Yeah, so retinal detachment basically happens. So the retina is, is stuck to the back portion of the eye. But every any time there is a trauma or there is some bleeding inside the eye. So when there is a bleeding inside the eye, as that blood is drying, it pulls on the retina. So it tugs it. And the retina is a very thin tissue-like structure. So every time it pulls on the retina, it breaks a small part of it. And then it can finally lead to a detachment. If there is a trauma to the eye, then again it can cause a small hole in the retina. Fluid goes behind the retina through that hole and it lifts the retina. So these are a few reasons why retinal detachments happen. Most common form of uh, retinal detachment. So the treatment for a retinal detachment is a surgery, sir. Without surgery, we cannot treat it. So we inject the oil or a gas inside the eye which pushes the retina back so it gets stuck again on the uh, back portion of the eye, the back wall of the eye. If the retina is uh, armed because of some problem, does it generate again? So, uh, ma'am, any nervous tissue, so retina is a nervous tissue because it's filled with nerve. So the question is if any part of the retina is damaged, does it regrow again? So the answer to that is any nervous tissue doesn't regenerate again. So if there is any part of the retina that is damaged, it is permanently damaged. If there is edema on the retina, then we can remove the edema and salvage that retina. But if there is severe damage, if there is some parts of the retina that are dead because there is no oxygen going to it or the blood vessel is blocked, then there is not much we can do to that. Because it doesn't regrow. Even the optic nerve, if it gets damaged due to glaucoma, it's a permanent damage. It doesn't regrow. Science has not advanced yet to help in regeneration of nerves. So, retina cannot be regenerated or transplanted? No, sir. You cannot transplant uh, a retina. You can only transplant cornea, sir. So, when we talk about eye donations, we talk only about donating the cornea. It's not the whole eyeball that is used. It's only the cornea that is used. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the reason. So the question is. The question is when um, before a cataract surgery or when we are as we are aging the number in our eyes keeps changing but after the cataract surgery we put one fixed lens and the number doesn't change after that. So the reason for that is sir the number changes in our youth because the eyeball is growing. Now after the age of around 25 to 30 the eyeball stops growing and the number stabilizes. Then again after 45 as the cataract starts developing as the cataract's density changes, the number again starts changing. So that is the second uh, round of number changing. But then once we take care of the cataract and we put a fixed uh, number lens inside the eye, then there is no reason for the eye's number to constantly change. However, in a few patients with glaucoma, the number can change because the shape of the eyeball keeps changing according to the pressure. But most of the people after cataract surgery, the number doesn't change. No, you don't have to, you just have to wear that particular number spectacles. Yeah. And in case of this cataract to laser, sometimes black laser caps are developed, why in some cases it develops? I'm sorry, can I? Yeah. Ah, so, sir's question is sometimes after a cataract surgery, the behind the lens a membrane forms. So that happens in, uh, it happens in around 20% of the patients where after 6 months to a year, sometimes even 5 years, a membrane forms behind the lens, which is very simply cleaned up with a simple laser procedure. It hardly takes 2 to 5 minutes 
and there are no precautions that you have to take as you would have to take after a cataract surgery but sometimes cells do grow and they form this membrane behind the uh, lens So the question is, is contact lens better than spectacles or is spectacles better? So in my opinion, I don't like contact lenses too much because A, it causes a lot of harm on the cornea. It can cause these small abrasions on the cornea. It can lead to infections. Many times people also don't take care of their contact lenses. It's not cleaned in a way that it should be cleaned. The care that you have to take when you're wearing contact lenses is not always taken. You know, you wear it for longer than 8 hours, it's not good for your eyes. Sometimes people sleep with the contact lenses. Sometimes people go for a swim with their contact lenses. These are all things that you should avoid. So it's safer and simpler to just wear spectacles. So I, I always encourage people to wear spectacles. Although for cosmetic reasons, people like to wear contact lenses. In those day, cases, you have to explain the, um, the do's and don'ts. The don'ts particularly. Yes, sir. So the sun's rays, if we start looking directly at the sun, it's very harmful because it can cause damage to your retina. If you have, a, if you not got a cataract done, then it can cause cataract also because the UV light in the sun's rays is what harms the, uh, it harms, it causes cataract also, and it causes uh, retinal problems also. And after the cataract surgery, see the lens that we have naturally in our eyes, it absorbs UV light. It absorbs a big spectrum of the UV uh, light spectrum. After we remove that lens and we put an artificial lens, it doesn't absorb as much UV light as the natural lens absorbs. So now if you are looking at the sun, then it causes more damage to your retina. So looking at the sun is, uh, I don't advise it. Not you should. So generally speaking, generally speaking, if there is a, so the question is, uh, what kind of glasses should we use to look at a solar eclipse? Generally speaking, I'd advise people not to look at the solar eclipse as much as possible because the, even though the, the brightness of the sun goes down, it's still, it's still exposing you to a lot of UV radiation. Although if you really must, then you have to get a high quality UV protective sunglasses and then only look at the eclipse UV protective yeah so you had a question so the question is lot of youngsters in their 30s and 40s getting cataract um, I don't know how accurate that statistic is because it's usually after the age of 50 it's still in my practice in all the hospitals I go to after the age of 50 is when I see cataracts but one of the reasons could be because nowadays people are getting severe inflammations in their eyes also for a lot of reasons. Even COVID has caused a big, it's caused a big question mark in all doctors' minds as to why it's causing so much inflammation everywhere across the body, including the eyes. Anytime there is inflammation inside the eye, it causes a mild, mild amount of cataract also forming. Although I don't know if that statistic is still accurate, whether 30s and 40 people are... But in the earlier days, uh, I think this, this is around maybe 40 years or 50 years ago. Yeah, so, but then diabetes was not as rampant back then. Now diabetes is happening at, at the age of 30 also. Diabetes is a big uh, cause of cataracts forming. So because of lifestyle changes and lifestyle diseases, it's happening earlier. But I will still say it's not happening at 40. It's happening after the age of 50 only. So. It has affected eyes in terms of it's causing a lot of uh, redness of the eyes. It causes a lot of inflammation inside the eyes. Um, basically, COVID is a very pro-inflammatory virus. So, anywhere it can cause inflammation, it's doing that. In fact, the reasons why a lot of youngsters are getting heart attacks is also because their blood vessels are getting blocked because of some inflammatory cause. You see? So, it is causing a lot of uh, inflammations as such.
So drooping of eyelids, firstly we have to find the reason why. Sometimes it can be because of some systemic illness like myasthenia gravis or something like that. If it is, then we treat that and the drooping goes away. But simple age related drooping has to be treated surgically only. So we have to prop it up using, by doing a surgery. So we do a sling operation where we take a suture and we just pull it up and then we tie the knot. It's all under the skin so nothing can be visible but it keeps the eyelids open then. Though they shut also, they shut. What kind of lens do you need to use for the cataract or the cataract? Some people say you need to use Indian lens, some people say you need to use So the question is what type of lens should be used after a cataract surgery? So there are multiple varieties of lenses. There are Indian lenses, there are foreign lenses. Of the foreign lenses because they've been the companies that make these foreign lenses are a little more reputable and they've been doing it for so many years the quality is slightly better the, the science that they use to make these lenses is slightly better the Indian lenses having said that the Indian lenses are also not bad at all we I use a lot of Indian lenses I use a lot of foreign lenses and of course the foreign lenses is slightly better but people are happy with the Indian lenses also then there are, the, there are differences in the material used. So there are lenses that are uh, water resistant and then there are water filic lenses. So that also makes a slight difference. But these are all technical things that uh, you know it's more, uh, it doesn't affect the quality of vision but how the lens will remain in the eye for the long term, it affects that uh, depending on what material you use. Then there are multifocal lenses and monofocal lenses. Multifocal lenses are lenses that take care of distance vision and near vision. And there are monofocal lenses which take care only of distance vision. Now every patient is different. So every patient requires a different kind of lens. I cannot say that one lens is better than the other. It depends on the patient. If a patient is someone who does a lot of outdoor work and is a say a driver by profession. For him, having a monofocal lens is always better because he just needs to see things in the distance. For near vision, he can use reading glasses. But if there is a, someone who is constantly reading something or you know a professional, then he might require a multifocal because he needs distance and near both. So it, it's all very personalized to the patient also. It's not harmful sir, it's good actually. It re reduces the strain on your eyes. Yeah, because if the letters are very small then you can use magnifying glass, there is no problem. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> you can use your normal goggles sir. Yeah, that's better, always better. Are progressive lenses better? Sir, progressive lenses are very good if you are used to them. Uh, it takes sometimes if you are going, if you are a new user then it takes around two weeks to get used to. But once you get used to it, people are very happy with progressive lenses. And they look also smarter, so people prefer them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what exactly are progressive lenses? So progressive lenses are basically they take care of distance, your intermediate distance and your near vision also. They are like bifocals but there is no line in the middle. So it's a seamless transition of the power. Whereas in bifocal there is clear distance and there is near with a line in the middle. So progressives are, there is a se it's seamless transition. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Arjun, uh, for a uh, excellent lecture because I, I thought it was perfectly made for a gathering like this. There were not too many technical uh, issues and you were short and sweet in every uh, aspect, everything that you spoke about. So I am sure and you answered the questions also very well. So thank you very much.
and uh, we hope to see you often and uh, i will repeat again that he is uh, attending our health center on every monday 5 onwards 5 to 6 uh, and uh, we are trying to see if we can add one more day also if we can get a slot he would like to come on some other day also that's what he said depending on the number of people coming so so i wish you all the best and on behalf of uh, everybody a thank you again thank you thank you everybody for uh, coming over for this uh, lecture and i should thank everybody uh, now sir we have mr bipin kulkarni and his uh, team ani uh, 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 sorry <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I should have taken your names earlier. Uh, I'm poor, poor at remembering names. But anyway, thanks for everything. And uh, Shobhan, thanks for all the arrangements. Shobhan and Swati, as usual. They, last evening we had a long program. Even after that, they sat and got things organized. So thanks to everybody, and thank you very much.